Greta, and I'm sorry that uh, you know with the connection problems. As you all know, Angtad has a very long history of working on transport and trade facilitation. I think many of you we have worked with, and the importance of these topics uh, has never been more apparent than during this pandemic that we have living through. Here at Angtad, we are very proud that our programs provide policy recommendations, practical and relevant support to overcome challenges and create opportunities like this for sharing lessons and good practices in these difficult reform areas. I say difficult because trade and transport facilitation reforms need the buy-in from many ministries and agencies, and they need very close collaboration of private sector and other stakeholders. And they are about deep institutional reforms, which are always very difficult as you will enlighten us with later on. And you will see soon at Ankar, we pay a lot of attention to trade and transport facilitation. We help countries setting up national trade and transport facilitation committees as required by the WTO trade facilitation agreement. We help develop needs assessments and implementation plans and draft uh, and implement transit agreements, help modernize ports, support transport corridors, set up trade information portals and help automate customs and other trade procedures through our ASICUDA program. So the list goes on. And by the way, I think you, many of you know, ASICUDA is Ankara's largest technical assistance program and accounting for over half of our support. And it brings sophisticated digital technological platforms to over 100 developing countries and territories. So under very difficult circumstances without no 4G, 5G and electricity failing and countries are able to use digital, sophisticated digital platforms. Now, since the COVID-19 pandemic, the need for digital solutions in trade and transport facilitation has become even more evident. And since early last year, when lockdown started affecting ports and border crossings, we are inundated with demands from our member states under our various technical assistance programs. So this is something that we would like to highlight as we prepare for the UNCTAD 15, you know, finalization of the negotiated text. And the need for further investment in efficient trade logistics services has also become evident through the current historically high freight rates that we are all going through. So we are carefully monitoring the implications of the bottlenecks and the high freight rates for trade, trade cost and inflation in collaboration. And with our colleagues in the trade division, we support national competition authorities to monitor carrier behavior. But nonetheless, this current crisis with high freight rates, congested ports, also illustrate the need for urgent investment in transport infrastructure, digital solutions, and, and this institutional reforms I mentioned. And please also note uh, in your agenda, the 18th of November, that is when we will launch our review of maritime transport 2021, which will address many of these issues that I mentioned. And some issues of concern are the seafarers predicament during this uh, pandemic and the impact of measures to reduce emissions from shipping. And we find that they are, uh, these reforms here, yeah, they are very good measures, but they are going to have a huge burden on uh, small and, you know, our SIDS and, and also the LDCs. So our Deputy Secretary General and the distinguished panelists in front of me, will enlighten us on these challenges and measures that different countries and organizations are taking and the lessons. So we will hear from you soon. And before I turn to our distinguished panelists, please use the Q&A function of the platform to write your questions to the panel. And my colleague, Luisa, uh, she's here now. She will collect these uh, queries and present to the panelists. Now, it is my great pleasure to give the floor to His Excellency, Mr. Fair Square, Minister of Commerce, Trade, Tourism and Transport of Fiji. And Minister, let me also thank you uh, wholeheartedly taking you know, up on this invitation at, at a very late hour. 
So we would really want to hear from you the amazing work you have been doing in Fiji. You have the floor, sir. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Excellencies, esteemed panelists, and the ladies and gentlemen, Bula Vinaka, and a very good morning and, and a good afternoon to you all. It's my pleasure to be, to be virtually participating in this panel discussions, and I acknowledge uh, the organizers for bringing us together. Um, I do not need to remind anyone present that we are in very uncertain times and that we are engaged in truly unprecedented dis discussions. We all live in this reality. Uh, every day, the world is trying to navigate through the economic wreckage caused by COVID-19 and the resulting 150 million people could be pushed into poverty uh, very soon, in addition to those who are already suffering. Needless to say, we must move urgently from dialogue to action to produce solutions that will not just stem the losses, but will keep vulnerable countries, especially since, uh, keep pace with the uh, um, inclusive global recovery. Excellencies and colleagues, the Pacific region is, is home to a number of the world's smallest small island developing states. And Fiji as one of the states faces many challenges with respect to international trade and due to our small size and remote location and the distance uh, from key markets. And to top it all, the, the existential threat we face in relation to climate change and environmental degradation. Our narrow resource base also, uh, small size and landmass means that our economy, economies are extremely vulnerable to natural disasters, which have the potential to wipe out resource supplies for the whole country and bring economies to an absolute standstill. In the longer term, uh, a rise in sea level threatens our very existence. Natural disasters also regularly disrupt our economic uh, activities and divert limited resources to rehabilitating and, and rebuilding the infrastructure. The COVID-19 pandemic has only exacerbated our uh, vulnerability and further exposed us to, to external shocks. It has wiped out decades of our development and investments that were made in a matter of months. Excellencies and colleagues, Fiji, comprises of about 300 tiny islets, um, hence the maritime trade and transport underpins supply chain linkages that are essential to Fijian business and, and support service sectors like tourism. So when disruptive factors such as climatic events and pandemics occur, it actually sends shockwaves across supply chains and, and transportation links and crippling businesses who depend on them. Our remoteness also entails dependence on transport providers with high transport costs, which are already higher for small volumes. So this restricts their ability to bargain for better prices or, or change to more efficient carriers if there are service lags, and thus raises the price of our imports and our exports. Excellencies and colleagues, Fiji's transport and, and logistic network were also disrupted due to a high degree by lockdowns and border restrictions that are implemented due to the pandemic. And this has a result, uh, as a result, has increased costs for freight and raw materials for production of goods and has also increased the time it actually takes to trade. So in order to maintain supply chains, especially for perishable goods, our national carrier, <clears throat> Fiji Airways, establish weekly freight services to help businesses plan and, and supply logistics. And despite this, transport and logistics poses a huge challenge for all our businesses. As a result, the production of goods uh, export is more costly in, in SIDS economies. And that is why it is difficult for our exporters to compete in a free global market. Economies of scale, cannot be realized by small local producers because the cost of materials and other inputs are high, and especially when they must be imported. The agriculture and the, the manufacturing sectors are important for income generation and, and also for food security, and is the main source of work for the majority of Fijians. So usually most of our exports are concentrated on, on, on commodities such as sugar, cane, and carver, and 
root crops and cocoa and coffee, banana, fish and tropical fruits and forest products and manufactured items including processed foods and textile and clothing and footwear. Unfortunately, most of these industries have suffered tremendously at the hands of natural disasters and due to the decline uh, in world market prices or end of uh, preference schemes. For instance, in response to, to challenges made within the WTO uh, based on the most favored nation principle, the EU's preference, uh, preferential arrangement on sugar, on which the sugar industry of Fiji and other cities actually relied upon, was eliminated. And it has exposed our exporters to competition from much larger and technologically advanced nations. So because of those disadvantages, we face market access on equal terms with other countries is unlikely to be enough to enable us to increase exports. And this is why preferential access is necessary for SIDS. We need the international trade regimes to accommodate our needs and contribute to our development. This can only be made possible if special provisions are created to address the challenges uh, SIDS are facing instead of using uh, a cookie cutter approach. It'll be difficult or even impossible to compete in a liberalized global market without special treatment uh, granted to SIDS. And moreover, instead of being pushed to meet inconsiderate international obligations being labeled as tax havens in pursuit of uh, attracting investments to create jobs in a, and support our economy. If the international community really wanted to help, this is where that they should start. Firstly, trade negotiations like fisheries subsidies, et cetera, agreements should mandate effective, appropriate carve-outs and special differential treatment uh, for seeds whose livelihoods uh, whose livelihood is dependent on, on small-scale artisanal fisheries. In addition to this, assistance can be rendered to, to enhance the competitiveness of small island producers to actually help address the inherent structural disadvantages of small and remote economies. Uh, this could include measures designed to address high production and transport costs to help identify and export, exploit the market niches or or to develop necessary infrastructure and skills to increase export capacity and competitiveness. COVID-19 has, has led to a surge in e-commerce and accelerated digital transformation, as you mentioned earlier. Um, and thus the support is needed in terms of, of building the capacity for the adoption of digital commerce platforms for trading, which will allow the cost reduction and enhance the competitiveness. And apart from the elimination of uh, lowering of duties and charges, it is actually vital uh, to implement uh, improvements to reduce trade by undertaking regulatory reforms um, for the ease of doing business and, and, and trade facilitation. Whilst we have requested assistance to implement these vital reforms, we've received little or no support on measures that actually require high levels of institutional capacity and resources that SIDS do not have access to. Trade has the potential to drive solutions uh, for climate change and building resilience, and thus SIDS requires support to adopt and promote mutually supportive economic and environmental policies that enable production in green sectors and scale up the use of clean technology. That is why an increased presence of UNCAD in the Pacific is imperative. It is imperative to understand the specific and the unique challenges to the Pacific Seas that the Pacific Seas face. A generic solution based on limited data offers little uh, to no benefit to addressing these key concerns. Therefore, the UNCAD 15 mandate or the text should capture the need to have tailor-made support measures for SIDS based on their most urgent needs to recover from their uh, inherent vulnerability and development. Excellencies and colleagues, it's obvious trade, as we all know, is the main engine and driver for economic growth and sustainable development, and SIDS are actually missing out. But it's not about just reducing trade costs, but eliminating structural disadvantages, adapting and mitigating climate change to enable countries to effectively participate in regional and, and global value exchange. So, so there is a, there's a whole lot more that uh, we see that UNCAD can do in this particular space. And these issues that I've actually highlighted have been 
subject to debate continuously. And the key question, uh, Excellencies, is how do we neutralize or minimize the constraints that SIDS face in terms of economic growth? It is an important test to the international community of how it treats its vulnerable members. And the special challenges are inherent vulnerability that we face must be taken into account in strategies for trade and development. For the SIDS to stay afloat and survive, we must and we absolutely must re-innovate and re-strategize our priorities for the benefit of all. I thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you, Excellency. Thank you very much for highlighting the challenges faced by Fiji and also other seeds. And we take uh, your message very seriously for the international community, how to support seeds effectively. And you emphasize you need a tailor-made support, not just the cookie cutter approaches. And we hear you loud and clear. And I, you know, it's not my staff that negotiate this text. And I think our member states are all connected. And I really do hope the, the negotiated text would uh, strengthen the plea from uh, SIDS. Thank you so much. And let me now uh, give the floor to Her Excellency, Ms. Biata Habiramina, Minister of Trade and Industry from Rwanda. Minister, as you would know, we work a lot in Rwanda and Rwanda is in, in many cases a success story for difficult institutional reforms that I talked about how bringing many ministries together and getting things done. You have the floor, Minister. Thank you. Uh, thank you, I was a little bit disconnected, but uh, I'm glad that the connection goes on. So your excellencies, distinguished panelists and uh, participants for this unclad event, uh, I'm glad to have this time. To go straight on the topic, uh, to have a sustainable and resilient supply chain has been a very big challenge in all our countries, especially with the arrival of the pandemic uh, throughout the country and overcoming vulnerabilities has been a great challenge between transport or global logistics. We have been facing like Rwanda many challenges and especially uh, not just at the national level, but also at the regional level vis-a-vis -vis the cross-border trade and procedures. Many of the constraints have been challenging countries uh, related to the infrastructure adequacy, some challenges related to the trade trading of cross-borders, as well as limited product diversification and value addition Additional challenges have been also uh, recorded coming to trade competitiveness as Rwanda is a landlocked country uh, on export sides, like for quality assurance, funding, packaging, and other limited capacities of the private sector engagement in standard trading activities. We have been facing a couple of uh, issues related to the global and regional infrastructure where the cost of production have been affected both due to the lack of economies of scale and as well as the structure of, nature, of the utility costs. But for all above those measures, it has been uh, increased with the unfortunate COVID-19 pandemic, which added more on the list. And therefore, Rwanda's economy recovery strategies looks at addressing effects of the pandemic, but also we continue addressing structural challenges to rebuild productive capacities. As a country have been working hard to have harmonized procedures in regards to trading under the COVID-19 preventing measures when it comes to the neighboring countries. The pandemic has been forcing countries to change strategies and priorities in order to keep flexible the cross-border procedures. And we have been working drastically to change the balanced trade traditions and the facilitation. Then we can say that instruments and tools comes in and are a key element to allow these changes in the balances of policy priorities. 
to just share a few with us, with you, is that in the way of handling the cross-border cargoes and trade procedures, the country has been putting in place establishment of a couple of uh, procedures and, re and regulations, as well as establishing like dry ports at entry points for the main trade corridor of the country. In collaboration with private sector members, we have had to work very closely to put in place new facilities for trade handling, management of truck drivers, and as well as putting in place transit centers. And we can see how the pandemic has really been affecting all the global logistics. It has understandable that as well, the cost of transports and the time of transit have been increasing a lot uh, during these tough measures due to lockdowns, where we have been seeing like days increasing from six to 16 additional days on average from Kigali to let's say Mombasa or Dar es Salaam, which are our entry points as a country. This resulted in an increase of course of costs, where I can just give you some examples from Kigali to Dar es Salaam, where there was an additional cost of $169, while the same from Mombasa to Kigali was raised to an additional cost of $600. We can see easily how the logistics sector has been really much hit by this pandemic for what it goes to uh, logistics. But we can also say that since mid-October 2020, we have seen the logistics sector starting to recover and get back to normal through those corridors and border traffics to, for the transit time and the cost. Thanks to the introduction we have been putting in place of a regional cargo and driver tracking system, which has been to facilitate what was done. Therefore, we can say that there are some specific key electors or key factors which would help any government when introducing these changes in order to have the strategies and priorities putting in place uh, easier and uh, more balanced trade facilitation. Just to name a few, we have been uh, seeing how proactiveness and strong leadership can bring new changes in this trade balance. Where it comes to having citizen trusts in the leadership to effectively cooperate with the population and change their normal behavior throughout the pandemic. In fact, a good leadership coupled with trust and positive responses of its population to policy measures initiated by the government provide a basis to generally anticipating fewer consequences compared to other countries where this has not happened. As well as daily publication of dates on COVID-19 cases by the Ministry of Health have helped in raising awareness on the risks in addition to the measure taken every two weeks. And this led to really average since reduce the, the, the impact. But I would also like to highlight how um, it is very important to have regulatory provisions uh, which can facilitate the acceleration of implementation of regulatory facilitation trade agreements. These can be sent by when it comes to increased access to trade related information, which is something key, especially in this period, to facilitate the clearance and release of goods during especially this period, as well as to coordinate with borders agencies to facilitate a harmonized procedure of movements of goods. But you can also not forget to innovate around creation of human-like interactions with customers without necessarily having them to meet physically by bringing digital products, which can facilitate to receive what they need. This has pushed the country, Rwanda, to accelerate our digitization agenda. And we can now collect really good fruits from it. Rwanda, in collaboration with UNCTAD and other stakeholders, established a trade informational portal. 28 required documents were removed. 25 steps have been eliminated. Administrative burden cost went down by $160. This is in addition to several regulatory agencies adopting automation of various licenses, permits, and certificates by allowing traders not only to submit application online, but also to obtain authorization documents online this as a measure to limit the spread of COVID-19. In my view, we can say that there are still a lot to overcome vulnerabilities in the transport and trade facilitation. And there are some key factors, but just to name few, we think that an increased collaboration between the government through regional and economic blocks with the private sector is essential to maintain, build and rebuild productive capacities. We also think that as a, a Rwandan is an African country, the African continent works for liberalization and diversification of trade under the African free continental free trade area by addressing impediments 
to competitiveness and unlocking new market opportunities on the African continent for both goods and services is therefore crucial to enhance the private sector capacities to formulate business ideas, to assess and select them, to implement them effectively and to develop economically some viable business ventures. It's our no beauty therefore in collaboration in ACTAD to facilitate post COVID-19 innovation solutions for business diversification and support enabling environment for competitive private sector that is integrated into regional and global markets, while as well ensuring a level playing field and protection of intellectual property rights, promoting e-commerce, strengthening productive capacities. This can only be realized through strong collaboration with all the stakeholders, including the academia, the research, the development partners, the financial institutions and policy makers, and innovators themselves. And we think that through those approaches, it's where we can really build strong transport and trade facilitation system throughout the world. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Your Excellency, for highlighting the difficulties that Rwanda has been facing as a transit country, as a small economy, and then off, off, on top of that, the COVID-19. Uh, but then you highlighted the actions that you have taken in terms of uh, you know, having a strong political leadership, working with private sector, digitalization, and you know, enhancing regional collaboration, how all those aspects contributed to the recovery. So thank you so much. And I think this is a very, very timely discussion to have and to hear the lessons and the good practices that you have had in your country. Thank you so much. So let me now turn to uh, Ms. Isabel Duran, the Deputy Secretary General of ANCTAD. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it is thanks to great advances in transport and trade facilitation that confronted with an unprecedented imbalance between demand and supply. There are simply not enough ships and containers to carry for the demand in maritime transport. Thanks to stimulus package and consumer behavior, demand for shipping has not declined in the wake of COVID crisis. What has changed, however, is the efficiency of the logistic systems. COVID-19 response in transport and industry have slowed down in the operations. This means that containers, ships, trucks, trailer, and equipment need longer to get back to the exporter. The additional time in the system takes up capacity, which is then missing in the market. But it is the energy transition that uh, the necessary decarbonization of international shipping, which is the most important challenge for the maritime industry in decades. It is as important as the move from sail to steam or from steam to oil. In this landscape, developing countries face numerous challenges, and let me highlight three. First, international transport costs have surged. To ship a container from Shanghai to Santos today costs 10,000 10, US dollars. Between 2010 and 2020, shipping a container on the same route cost on average only $2,000. The high threat rates hit smaller and weaker trading nation particularly hard. Second, digitalization in transport and trade facilitation, such as custom automation, single window, trade information portals, or electronic payments, they have helped uh, dealing with the, the crisis. Demand for UNCTAD support to digital solution has thus been increasing as our solutions reduce the need for physical contact in ports and border crossing and help government to protect populations. Third, climate change. On one hand, transport is a major contributor to global greenhouse gas emissions. But on the other hand, transport is also severely affected by the impacts of climate change. 
we need measures aimed at decarbonizing international shipping, but we must ensure that the most vulnerable economies receive the necessary support to implement sustainable shipping in their countries and mitigate increases in maritime logistic costs. Ladies and gentlemen, Hungat has a long history of working on international transport and trade facilitation. Our mandate in this area dates back to our first ministerial conference in 1964. The conference recommended that UMTAT should promote arrangements for intergovernmental action for the simplification of formalities related to, relating to trade and custom procedures. A milestone was reached in 1994, when UMTAT's UNTAC, work on transport and trade facilitation led to the United Nations International Symposium on Trade Efficiency, culminating in the Columbus Ministerial Declaration on Trade Efficiency. This conference and the resulting declaration were instrumental for the inclusion of trade facilitation in the agenda of the first WTO Ministerial Conference in Singapore in 1996. I want to stress that trade facilitation is not important because we have the WTO Facilitation Agreement. Rather, the WTO took the topic of trade facilitation on board because of its growing importance for development. It is in this vein that we are working on these issues with full dedication so that current challenges associated with international transport and trade facilitation can be overcome and their resilience and sustainability is enhanced. I thank you for your attention. Excellent. Thank you very much. So let me now talk, uh, turn to Mr. Owen Holder, the controller of customs Barbados. And Owen, you're also an alumni or part of uh, Angtad and Asikuda family. So very good to see you. Thank you, moderator. And yes, I'm very glad to see my former um, colleagues. And um, I'm sure that the relationship will continue as we work together. And um, to you, Your Excellency, fellow panelists, ladies and gentlemen, the Barbados Customs and Excise Department view this as a prestigious opportunity to be a panelist among such esteemed persons and to participate in this dis discussion. We in Barbados are cognizant of our challenges of international transport, mainly for one reason, and that is because of our location. As the most Eastern country in the Eastern Caribbean, we are outside the major shipping lanes. And this often results in higher freight costs than our immediate neighboring islands. Additionally, as a small developing country, with limited financial resources, we have little or no capability to provide our own international transport. And yes, our transport costs are high, high hence our vulnerabilities. Today, discussions surround the supply chain and, log and logistics of international trade. I therefore feel compelled to set the framework in defending what I consider to be logistics. And for me, it is a function responsible for the movement of goods globally. It manages the transport and storage of goods on the journey from original suppliers through the supply chain and on to the final consumers. Logistic chains are constantly changing to suit increasingly global movements of goods. Generally, long-term trains and logistic services indicate a growing degree of product customization and an increased responsiveness in order, in order to facilitate delivery. These trends impact in various ways on operations of the supply chain. For example, technolog technological changes are directly correlated to ch changing trends. But the most fundamental change is that to satisfy customer access to commodities when they are needed. Hence, there's a need for the seamless operation of the supply chain that will supply the goods with ultimate satisfaction. I also think for clarity, that is important to define the supply chain 
within the parameters of this discussion. Here I think the here I think the appropriate definition would be the entire process of making and selling commercial goods, including every stage from the supply of materials and manufacture of goods through to the distribution and sale. The attitude management of the supply chain is critical at the company stage and also at the global stage. Certainly, it can be concluded that the business success of a company through the effective management of the supply chain is important. But because of the possible economic impact and consequences on economies, especially those that are small and vulnerable, the management of the supply chain is even, even of greater importance. Research has shown that the efficient management of the supply chain results in 71% or more customers likely to be recurrent. If they are happy with the way their processes are handled, the overall outcome of this satisfaction is improved economic activity for the related company. The relationship between economies, supply chain and logistics can be seen in the following example. The US statistical abstract indicate that with a US economy with a gross domestic product of $10 trillion, $2 trillion may be spent a year on logistics with half of this on transportation costs. The UK government further says that 6% of its GDP comes from transport and storage. This suggests that logistics costs are considerably high, but it's also sure the impact it has on economic develop development. One must be cognizant, however, that each step of the supply chain carries countless risks and possib possibilities, not only to derail an entire customer order, but to negatively impact on the country's economy. Minimizing the delay, optimizing the time of day that goods are, are moved, the length of time that the inventory is held, and the order dispatch process are all points that can have huge impacts on the operation. One common principle in all of this is cost. The observation is that cost will not only impact on organizations, but can have a detrimental effects on, on economies, which may be even more impactful on small economies. In the case of LDCs, the World Bank has recognized the constraint and economic impact experienced by these countries, and therefore have implemented the Almaty program of action to assist them. ICT infrastructure and transport projects have been organized with emphasis on trade facilitation and connectivity. The intended object objective here was to reduce costs. The world has witnessed the impact of transportation limitation when the evergreen became stuck in the Suez Canal. Bloomberg immediately predicted that there was a loss of $9.6 billion worth in traffic daily. Charter rates were predicted to rise and the news resulted in an immediate rise of $2 per barrel on all, per, all prices. I hope I've made the point here. Any obstruction in the supply chain link will result in costs. In this regard, in Barbados, companies have indicated that freight costs have increased and this was reflected in increased consumer prices. This clearly indicates that my country's, this clearly indicates my country's vulnerability to international transport of goods. The issue of enhancing trade facilitation within COVID environment also play a part in our, in our discussions. Customs, COVID has changed completely the way we do things. In the initial stages, Barbados Customs was required to facilitate, facilitate essential goods and essential medicines only as we, sought, as we sought to deal with the fallout. This meant that all other goods were held at ports of entry until give, government gave the okay. This cer certainly had cost consequences. Immediately after the okay was given for normal activity, our trusted trader program facilitated the quick release of goods the company which participated therein. Today, that program continues to operate and facilitates quick delivery of goods 
to participating countries, companies, sorry. Additionally, we continue to operate our risk management process through clangers and executed within the specified lanes, which are red, green, yellow, and blue. Hence, from our viewpoint, COVID has the impact of COVID has been minimized and our trade facilitation delivery has been going in a major way. And this I must say can be contributed to the using the functionalities of our secure world. Also because of our secure world, we have developed and used the SD4 regime to facilitate consolidated clearing goods on behalf of importers. The advantage was to, was to consider reduce the number of persons entering the port to clear goods. This would have assisted greatly in reducing personal contact, contact and as the experts would have said, control the expansion of the virus. It, is if, it therefore would be a miss of me not to reference the implementation of ASI code, code world and its electronic technologies, which have given greatly, which have provided greatly to our customer delivery to play its role in enhancing the supply chain. Clearly, although a lot of work needs to be done, this facility has positioned us to advance our remit and UTA has, has its role to play in this regard. It should be noted that UTA is now participating in the development of the electrical single window in Barbados. And this is important to us as we seek to seek, as we seek to fulfill the, the trade facility and agreement requirements in our country. Ontad, however, can clearly expand its role in providing customer functionalities, giving support to new custom procedures and give added training, adequate training, which is essential for our customs modernization. This preamble therefore lays Barbados foundation for our discussion on the assessment of global trends and challenges for logistics of international trade and what developing economies can do to reduce their vulnerabilities in the area of transport and trade facilitation. Barbies will certainly have an input in the expanded outcomes and will make appropriate recommendations as to the role UTA can play in helping countries like ours who, because of COVID, are under financial strain. Thank you, Chairman, for the opportunity, and I look forward to the discussions. Thank you, Mr. Holder. And I think it's very important to recognize that UNCTAD 15 is held in Barbados. So we really, it's, it's good to hear the voice of Barbados. And thank you so much for highlighting the economic cost of inefficiencies and bottlenecks of logistics. Uh, Professor Bano Myung, I think you will probably pick up a lot of this. And it is extremely uh, important to put numbers, the, 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 the the monetary values to these inefficiencies to get the year, to get the years of your finance ministries, you know, who, who, who writes the check at the end of the day. Thank you so much. So let me now move to uh, Mr. Bismarck Rosales, CEO of Port Jennifer, Bolivia. Before Mr. Rosales comes on board, please, I will, would like to uh, ask our participants to write your Q&A in the slot called Q&A. So uh, my colleague Luisa then will present them to the panelists. Uh, Mr. Rosales, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Good morning for, uh, for me. Good afternoon for all of the years. Uh, I thank you to, let, uh, to uh, let me to participate in these discussions. I want to say a big hello for you. Uh, Shanika, I'm sorry if my pronounce is not correct, and all the speakers in this event. I will begin to say a uh, geographical situation of Bolivia. Bolivia is a country that is located in the heart of South America, in this Mediterranean country, or without a sea coast. At present, Many national products are not competitive in the international market, not because of high production costs or low quality or a lack of technology, but because of long logistics to reach the ports of neighboring countries, which is expensive, inappropriate to develop the potential of the Bolivian exportable supply. Therefore, Bolivia needs to have an integrated logistic. 
but we have two ways to develop the, its fluvial maritime trade. The first one is to reach the neighboring countries on the Pacific, Chile or Peru, traveling in truck between 2,500 to, to 2,700 kilometers. Or the second way is the Atlantic Oceans by Paraguay Paraná waterway. It, it has 2,700 kilometers. In Bolivia, the port system, Bolivia has three, three uh, private ports, and none of which are public. But do add to our regulatory uses, no private port could carry out foreign trade operation, except private companies with their own port. Nor did they have a river custom office, which could carry out the nationalizations and or export of cargo. But how to resolve these two big issues that greatly affect the economic development of the, of the country? Being that this account with a great exportable capacity, example, in 2021, it was moving over 11.5 million of tons, and until 2025, the government predicts to triple the Bolivian production. This, however, will be impossible in an inappropriate logistics. Thus, the only situation is to sit down at the public and private table and discuss the, the matter jointly. Since the investment, investment is private and the regulation belongs to the state, but the interest, the interest is developing the country, it's the common denominator. This is how we have managed to do it. Thanks to the program Train for Trade from UNTAC with a training of the modern management of port where we find us the same level, military organizations, marines, QSIM and prebates. That started with the first group in 2017, and currently there is the third version of it. It has been from the here where the solution we were looking for originated. And it was the final war of the participant. It was fantastic because the solution was in all this discussions table. First, to adapt the normative of ports such that the private ports managed to do export an important achievement. Same thing to this thesis, the general direction of Bolivian Maritime modified the regulation and in October of 2018, the three Bolivian ports started be, uh, being international ports, which is the beginning of the new era for the tra Bolivian Strait. Second, to create the fluvial custom, adapting the normative of the terres uh, uh, terrestrial custom in the same way in August of 2019, one of the ports made all the investment necessary to have the first fluvial custom of the country. Putting Bolivia in the global road of river sea commerce, because in the past, if you come, uh, came from uh, Asia to Bolivia, you have not some uh, custom code. Now we have is the seven five ones. And the third, to integrate an information system that allows the streamlines the documental process. Now the lie in the barges and creating the lies that severely punish the export. With this result, we had managed to surpass from 1.4 million of tons moving through the waterway Paraguay Paraná to 2.1 million tons just in the first years. It means 50%. The Bolivian navigation system is like this. You can get from any port in the world and you arrive and, uh, to the ports of Atlantico, Argentina, or Uruguay. From our, from our, uh, or the uh, entrance to the waterway where transshipment or ships from overseas or to barges. This convoys sail until the frontier from Brazil, Bolivia, where the draw is approximately uh, 15 feet in deep water and reach five in shallow ones. However, Boliv however, Bolivia has a greater problem. The weather cycle of the uh, weather watt, which is composed of an annual cycle of action and descent of the water label that causes 
two months every year, the water level to be so low that makes sailing impossible. The years 2020 and 2021 has been very harsh for the Bolivian fluvial maritime commerce, accounting three factors. First, pandemic, global crisis of shipment and containers, very low uh, water level and forestal fires. This was a big problem, just not for Bolivia, for Brazil too, because we are uh, in, in the border. The water level of the mega cycle of every 50 years affects the navigation in the Bolivia, in Bolivian Tamingo Canal. By the lack of trading as much in the Bolivian side as in the Brazilian side of the canal. Science, the shipping companies don't want to get to Bolivia for this motive, and they want that to increase their freight considerably. This is how we are currently cited on against government and prebates, discussing an agenda on which each has its advances. Until the drugs is made, one of the poor has found the way to take the barges from Bolivia to Brazil with a special tag of low draft and take them to deep waters throughout a cabotage operation with the coordination with the Brazilian Maritime Authority. However, with the low water level and the lack of cargo for the pandemic, is that we have seen that prebates can create a shipping company fleet for low drafts and make an extension of the port with Paraguayan sports, allaying and gathering Bolivian and Paraguayan cargos, such that there, there is a division by section of the navigation. The first to lead with the barge up to the frontier Bolivia Brazil with a small tag. The second stretch is from there up to Asuncion, Paraguay, with a shipment for, of low draft and convoy or smallest barges. The theory is that the tax of deep water came from Argentina and Uruguay and take the along with the Paraguayan cargo. This will be working from the second semester of 2022, preparing to wait the 3 million tons to arrive by the end of 2022, by the waterway Paraguay Paraná up to 5 million in 2025. This means that the ports are also making important investment. One of, they, one, one of them has culminated in seven portuary terminals between dedicated and multiple poses terminals. Also preparing for the cargo reefer, urea and minerals and the different uh, products that Bolivia has to offer. We are making the fluvial maritime commerce and events like this where they are about to search for overcame the vulnerabilities and the transport and the facilitation of commerce to ensure the prosperity for everyone. Make that our country have more chance to improve the quality of life of our citizens. And for the governments and private sector to each country have to work together in the same manner, the allied uh, governments and the private sector of the micro macro regions, we will overcome all the difficulties. Congratulations to the organizer of the 15th conference of Barbados and I say goodbye with the word of the message from the first minister, Mutri, accounting with the committee of making the UNTAC 15 a transformative conference with transformative results. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Rosales. For, for taking us through how uh, landlocked Bolivia is making land linked. And uh, you talk about integrated logistics. And I think one of the very important points that you raised was the impact of climate change, the real impact on the ground on climate change. And this is something uh, Minister Koya also mentioned, I must say, and this is also reflected in the UNCTAD 15, the text that is being negotiated among member states that the issues of climate change and the importance of building resilience. So these are very, very important things to take very seriously. Thank you very much. So now let me uh, turn to Professor Ruth Bonomion. Uh, I think you probably can capture all this discussion because you have been doing analytical work on logistics and uh, supply chain fronts for a very long period of time. 
and has emerged as the premier expert in the world in this area. So it's, we are very happy to have you, Professor Banamion. So you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. And I think because I'm the only academic, uh, the organizers have allowed me to uh, have a very short presentation in order for me to, to come and share with you a bit some of my observation, my insight uh, based on these issues of uh, trade, transport facilitation, uh, logistics development, supply chain. And what I would like to do today is really to say that when we talk about uh, supply chain, one of the big challenges this is that there's basically two levels. The first level is really what the firms are doing, trying to connect to each other, suppliers, manufacturers, distributors, retailers, and then the role of governments and how do these governments uh, either facilitate or impede the flow of materials, the flow of information that may occur uh, between uh, these various stakeholders in, in the supply chain. So here I would just, I basically have just two slides, but here I would just like to say that, yes, I think we are all aware, and I think all the panelists have been very, very clear that the pandemic has really affected global supply chain, not only from a supply and demand perspective, but also from an infrastructure perspective, from a regulatory perspective, and also has affected very, very strongly uh, the logistics service providers. Who would have thought, for example, that, for example, from my area of the world, which is Southeast Asia, I'm based in Thailand, we would see now train services being offered Vietnam to go to Europe so that the shippers do not need to have access to the, the shipping line because they feel they're taken hostage by, by, by the shipping line. Who would have thought of that you know, in the past? So the pandemic in itself has, I think, accelerated certain issues that we have seen in, uh, in international trade, in international logistics, but new types of barriers have also uh, appeared. And I think this is where it's very challenging because Yes, we have the WTO uh, TFA agreement. There's, it's now in effect. But what I have noticed also is that the interpretation of the WTFA is very different depending on, on the countries. So again, this is something that, yes, the principles are there, but probably we need to go into more details in terms of making all on the same wavelength. So these thing that has happened because of the COVID has illustrated that the supply chains now are very fragile. And what can policymakers do to help make these uh, supply chains more resilient and more uh, sustainable? So allow me to share with you a, a small mental model that I try to conceptualize over the weekend. And we'll start first with sustainable and resilient supply chain. So this is the objective. This is what we want to achieve. Well, in order to have sustainable and resilient supply chain, I think we can't run away from this. We need to talk about infrastructure. And when we look at infrastructure, you will have both sustainable and resilient infrastructure. It's a word that we have seen, I think, for the past 10 years now, resilient infrastructure. And we have examples like the infrastructure that you have, for example, in Japan, when they have earthquakes, in. So the key part here is that when you're thinking of developing new infrastructure included in the design, you need to have what we call fail safe design. So if something happens, then the damages will not be so much so that you can rehabilitate it a lot uh, faster than if it wasn't included from the beginning of the design. Then the second point is all this concept of responsiveness, agility, flexibility, of the infrastructure itself. And that needs to be included since the design. So this is in fact forcing us uh, to think differently when we're thinking of designing infrastructure. And last but not the least is because infrastructure involves a lot of money, so good governance is very, very important. And if you can have like PPPs, public-private partnership, that will also be good. 
But apart from being resilient, we must not forget that the key word today is sustainability. It's talked about the issues in terms of the environment, and I totally agree. When we look at uh, infrastructure, what is the impact of uh, the infrastructure, of the new infrastructure that is going to be built uh, on the environment? But that should not be the only side that you should look at. But you also need to think from a circular economy perspective. Again, another keyword, everyone's talking a lot about the circular economy, but that is very important. How do you include the resource efficiency and the circular economy concept within the issue of sustainable infrastructure. So these two points, I would say, is more focused on the hardware. Now let's talk about the software. A few moments ago, I talked about trade facilitation. And yes, I think this is a, a word that we are very familiar with. And still today, we have a lot of challenges with trade facilitation. But one of the key messages each country has a right, and it is uh, legitimate for each country to have their own rules and regulation. So I think probably one of the uh, key message is really about the transparency. Yes, it can be complicated, but as long as it's transparent and everyone knows what to expect, at least that is a good starting point. Secondly, is the predictability. Yes, going through a border is never easy, but at least if it's predictable, it's a good starting point. And last but not the least, and we have seen this during the pandemic is we have not seen or not much seen uh, countries where they've in fact enabled exceptions uh, in case of emergency. In fact, we have seen the other way around so that the countries are in fact closing themselves more. So this is something that I think needs to be a probably further discussed so that uh, in case of a pandemic such as the, the COVID, maybe we could have fail-safe design in, even in terms of the facilitation. And last but not the least, let me talk about transport facilitation and listening to the discussion from uh, Rwanda. Yes, secure cross-border models are very, very uh, critical because the border is in fact quite often the weakest link in the supply chain. And last but not the least, standardized information system because we need to be able to communicate. What I'm showing here is just a reflection of what is possible if you know policies are there to develop sustainable and resilient supply chain. But we must not forget that apart from the policy, we need to think in terms of the monitoring and evaluation. And this is where baseline data is very uh, important. And uh, I'm very sorry though there are some global indicators, but we, we need to dig down further to really establish a real database of indicators that reflects both trade facilitation, transport facilitation, logistics, connectivity, and we can even go as far as infrastructure. And with this, I think I would like to end my presentation and uh, give the, the floor back to the chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Banomiong. And this is exactly what we thought that you would bring this really new perspective and, you know, thinking through uh, these issues of our time. And thank you so much for the policy map. In fact, I think we should get together and develop a, a, a policy brief to share with our member states this thing, new thinking that you have. I think this is a, a spot on. Thank you so much. So now we are coming to the end of our, the, the panel, uh, the presentations. So can I invite my colleague, Luisa, to uh, have a couple of questions because I think we have 15 minutes to go. Uh, little, uh, yeah, little more than you know, about, about 19 minutes to go until four o'clock. Luisa, you have the floor. Thank you, Shamika. Um, I have uh, several questions. I will try to group them so that we can address them. So I would start with this uh, first cluster of questions that relates to the issue of how to set priorities when sometimes the aspect of sustainability can collide to a certain extent with the cost issue. How do you prioritize among those issues? And I have a, a, a comment about uh, from Miguel Cordova who is asking, how can we include this integrative perspective between sustainability when we design public policies for mitigation and adaptation 
for the effects of climate change into supply chains. Maybe there would be a financial oriented mindset that could uh, uh, try to prevail. So how do we deal with this decision making with this two areas uh, when we talk about uh, some elements that have been discussed, like for instance, requiring further investment, changing the way we do operations, which has been discussed by the panel. So this is Miguel's question. And um, um, there was another question in this, uh, the respect uh, in terms of the issue of how can countries be supported in terms because one aspect that is very important, we heard some discussion about decarbonization. How can countries be supported? Because there would be a big need in order to promote a change in energy, energy metrics. So promoting the generation of clean energy with a view to uh, cope or deal with climate change. How can SIDS, Latin America, how can they be internationally supported so that they can be part of global change in a more high, leading to higher competitiveness, but also increasing their sustainability? So that would be one first question. I have others, but let's uh, maybe start, get the ball rolling with that one. Thank you very much. Maybe Luisa, because we don't have much time, why don't we uh, get all the questions and then we will uh, get the panelists to pick and choose uh, and answer some of these questions. Yeah, please. Okay. Uh, I have a question also um, in terms of what can UNCTA do? What kind of targeted role, kind of targeted support would UNCTA have a critical role in addressing? with respect to the challenges that have been highlighted in this session. This is a very interesting question. And um, uh, a question about the, uh, would you support the creation, this is addressed to Professor Bania Myung, would you support the creation of shipping lines supported finance controlled by national governments? Uh, what, what is your take on this element? We've heard during the crisis, this argument coming uh, forth in the media. Um, what about e-commerce logistics giants uh, who are maybe already buying ships from themselves? So those uh, would be the questions, thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm sure that we cannot, add, you know, I mean, these are very fundamental. These are big uh, questions of our time. But, uh, you know, we will probably have a days and days to discuss, but we, I will give the floor to uh, our panelists and please uh, share we, uh, with us your thoughts. But, you know, this is a conversation that we will continue to uh, uh, have as we go forward. So, uh, Your Excellency, uh, Minister Koya, would you like to take the floor of addressing some of these issues? Minister, you are uh, you are uh, muted. Yeah. Yeah, happy happy to take the yeah, floor. Just a couple good. of things, uh, which may take care of uh, two of the questions. The first two. Now, as I'd actually mentioned in my earlier delivery, we, we anticipate an actual thorough stock take of of, uh, of a country situation, and based on this particular data, we need to have tailor made support measures and development financing is what, what should be provided. Now, with respect to uh, um, the, the second question that was raised, and I'm talking about the one where we need to promote more ambitious climate change mitigation and to ensure that most vulnerable countries are not the ones most negatively affected uh, by higher transport costs. Now, we have something called the ACCTS. It's an agreement on climate change and trade and sustainability. Apart from the from all the work uh, it's doing in the international arena relating to climate change mitigation and adaptation, we are also ensuring that there is a nexus between trade and the, and the environment. Hence, we have joined the negotiations for ACCTS and was launched by our honourable prime minister, alongside Costa Rica, Iceland, New Zealand, Norway, and Switzerland. This is last September. And through this agreement, we are looking at a uh, looking at basically transformative solutions uh, in order to meet the commitments of the Paris Agreement. And the global trade architecture is a central part of this particular transformative solution. 
which can improve economies and lift incomes as well as, as support the environment. And by removing trade barriers for green products and, and services and stopping the pollution from being subsidized, uh, um, trade can actually contribute to our goals and climate ambition. The reason why Fiji has actually joined this negotiation as chair is to bring the SIDS and development country perspective. And this is how Fiji is trying to ensure that we are not negatively affected uh, by decisions made at the international level by being part of the discussions itself and making a case for developing an, an LDC trade and development. We also have the Pacific Blue Partnership Enterprise. In addition to this, Fiji has uh, the RMI, the Solomon Islands, Vanuatu, Tuvalu, and Samoa are actually parties to the Pacific Blue Shipping Partnership. And it's a country driven approach uh, through which each party can identify maritime transport decarbonization needs. And each party would be at liberty to, to develop its own unique uh, needs based program on their level of development, which will help achieve their national or na national targets. Fiji is, is of the view, uh, Chair, that the Pacific's vision of net zero emissions from the shipping industry will be achieved if we are able uh, to become the center for green and sustainable shipping. We need development partners, obviously, uh, not just to bring the best technology and low emissions, but to build capacity. And that's one of the most important things for, for us is to build capacity in constructing these particular vessels locally. We will need to revive and grow our shipbuilding industry and not only to create jobs and sustainable livelihood, but we act, it helps us become more self-sufficient. We need to uh, support in research and development and capacity building alongside fundamental investments in low carbon uh, cargo and, and passenger ferries. I mean, you know, we, we really need to achieve the full package and to ensure that we're actually not left behind. One of the biggest challenges also that we, we face is, is uh, the access to climate finance. And this has actually been mentioned in a lot of different forums by Fiji. We've had the, we are in a fortunate position. We've had the advantage of being, of heading up um, uh, one of the uh, uh, COPs and our Honourable Prime Minister actually chaired it. So we, you know, we have a great voice and I think that was a great voice, not just on behalf of Fiji, but on behalf of all seats and small island uh, states. I hope that answers the first, at least the first two questions, Chair. Thank you very much, Minister. And thank you very succinctly, uh, you know, putting uh, together your answer, very insightful uh, uh, remarks. Thank you so much. So could I please invite uh, Minister Habaya Rimana uh, for some remarks on these uh, queries that were raised. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I think it has been well explained uh, by His Excellency Siddiq, but I would like just to highlight one point uh, where the questions came in uh, what we should expect from UNCTAD to support. Uh, I think there's a specific point which has been shown during this pandemic uh, as the most vulnerable countries uh, have been quickly identified when it comes to trade facilitation and logistics. And I think from that side, uh, we need to look for business innovation, uh, being able to create new ways of financing development to transport so that the cost which is currently being faced can get de decreased through uh, one key element we have been experiencing as Rwanda and would even recommend for other countries, uh, innovative ways of collaborating with the private sector because we're still going on with this pandemic, but uh, our private sector has to collaborate very closely with the government. So that new ways of uh, managing the trade facilitations are created from one country to the other. A second point I think will be an emphasis on the digitalization of transports in shipment, uh, not just at regional level, but also at global level. Uh, this is something key, especially during this period where we can see many changes during this pandemic by simplifying the formalities, uh, increasing the access to trade information, as well as bringing down the transit time. Uh, because we know that many countries are being affected one time or the other with kind of lockdowns or even other uh, global logistic disruptions through this pandemic. So we think that digitalization should be a point where uh, it should be emphasized through all the countries and through all the programs to facilitate but I also think that uh, in terms of thinking about innovation or innovative solutions for business, 
we have to support in a specific way, enabling environment for the competitiveness of private sector and to help them to get integrated into the regional and global market. And for that specific point, I think about the e-commerce as a specific area where uh, development, innovative solutions, collaboration, exchange between government and private sector should be emphasized so that at least for those areas, uh, countries have been showing vulnerabilities in international trade, uh, transport uh, can really overcome those challenges. I will just highlight those two, three key points uh, and then thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. They are very uh, important points. And I think, as you said, this is uh, points that we also can internalize. And on this regard, I would like to mention to all of you, we have a very strong e-commerce program. We do help countries to assess, basically do diagnostics and where are the challenges and where are the opportunities for engaging e-commerce. And we will be launching a very big program in the Pacific uh, Minister Koya, you would uh, you be very happy to hear. And I think many of you mentioned about the importance of digitalization. And this is what Asikuda has been doing for the last 40 years to bring digital means, you know, bring very sophisticated platforms. And many of you also talked about the, uh, the, 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 you know, bringing together of private sector and multi-stakeholder groups and, uh, and, and of different government agencies. And I'm very happy to say that the National Trade Facilitation Committees, the work that we are doing to strengthen these National Facilitation Committees in about 50, 60 countries, exactly to bring these you know, different groups together to, uh, to the table so that they can begin the discussion of you know, cutting the red tape. So there are many things that we do, uh, but also as uh, uh, Minister Koya, you mentioned, that they are all tailor-made programs. So please, we are here, you know us, all what you need is to have an email to send to us saying that, uh, have a request made to UNCTAD. So then we begin the process. So our work normally is demand-driven. We don't go out and just waste uh, governmental officials and other agencies time just doing capacity building. So it is a true request. So just to let all of you uh, the know so let me now go to um, uh, Mr. Holder. Would you want to take the floor and address some of these issues? Thank you, Chair. Yes, um, specifically, I would want to respond to the issue of um, mitigating um, climate change. I, I think that one of the things that we recognize in the small economies is that we are are very reliant on the use of fossil fuels. Huh? And, and, that, and that is um, one of the major issues of the emissions of um, undesirable gases in the atmosphere. So I, I think that there must be a need for us to focus on that in the smaller economies and to, to with the view of trying to see how we can reduce the use of fossil fuels. Clearly my government is, is cognizant of that and what we've done is that we have set a really ambitious program to reduce, to eliminate the importation of vehicles that use fossil fuels by the year, I think, 2032. This would mean that we will now have to import an, um, all, only electric or hybrid vehicle, vehicles. As a matter of fact, the, the, the government has indicated to all ministries that any new purchases will have to be electronic or hybrid or hybrid um, vehicles. And, and this, this set this tone for where we should go in, in smaller economies. But the issue here is, given the cost of the new technologies, can the small economies afford them? And this is where we have to partner now with the bigger countries to ensure that those um, technology, the cost of those technologies are reduced considerably to, to facilitate that, that um, mitigating change that is really desirable uh, for, for climate change. Another issue that I think that should be considered here is that we have not seen any major movement in the use of solar technology in the shipping industry. Huh? And I think that that becomes very important as going forward. Um, I think that there's no other uh, means of transport that is exposed to the sun, to the solar activity more than um, ships. 
and therefore there can be this technology is something that can be used uh, greatly to to propel you, um, those um, vehicles through the the oceans. And therefore, although this might be slightly outside of your remit, um, chair, this is something that could be discussed uh, with other um, organizations, other entities, other countries to ensure that there's a, 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 a quick movement in that direction where we can have that, that whole um, reduction of the emissions into the atmosphere. So those are, those are my two points that I think are critical as we look, for, look at this question and to be considered as we go forward. Thank you, thank you so much for these important points. Uh, please also, I'm just saying in general, please also uh, take the opportunity to the, our member states who are listening in to engage in the Ankar 15 negotiating text, because this will this is the very, uh, the first, uh, the big UN meeting, you know? I mean, after this uh, COVID-19 hit us hard, uh, take the opportunity to highlight these emerging new issues and the concerns uh, for developing countries as you go forward. So let me now give the floor to Mr. Rosales. Thank you. Okay. In, in Bolivia, we are in South America, we have a, a, a different problems because we are five countries. We need to approach, we use the same river, the same uh, waterway, five countries. And if we want to go the uh, Pacific Ocean, we need to go for different countries. And every country work uh, prevailing and governing uh, everyone, but we need to work together. We need institution uh, to help to work together, like UNTAC or the, another international institution, where we have to see the same problem with the same uh, way. Uh, the uh, pandemics problems, the cargo problems, the shipments, etc. We are in some fantastic bioma. It's called Pantanal. It's a fantastic place. But we have to look at it with the same uh, uh, objective. And thus we are working too hard. When I say when the government and the private we are together, fantastic. But now we have to open our mind and to see all the area, all the regions with the same areas and the connection with the, all, uh, the rest of the world. I think uh, uh, we are working too hard in that. Bolivia is, was born, I say, a few years ago in the, uh, com uh, in the commercial uh, fluvial maritime, and we hope to, uh, to progress in the, in the next years because we, our country needs, because our population needs, and all of them uh, are waiting for some solution. And even like this one is the... I think it's a fantastic scenario to, to talk about that because country like uh, uh, Barbados, Rwanda, etc., has this similar situations and we can use your experience and we can to learn from you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much. Let me now give the floor to Professor Bano Myung. Uh, last but not the least, uh, Professor, you have the floor. Thank you, thank you very much. I, I think this is the academic in me speaking is that when we talk about uh, sustainability and environmental impact, what we see missing is a baseline in, in terms of the carbon emission. And I would say probably it would be very important to have like a kind of a, a, a repository of the carbon emission of the main trade lanes, the main freight lanes. Because then we'll see and we then can assign also who in fact, originated the carbon emission and all these things. And, and it will probably make things clearer. And with the countries coming to the table, uh, talking together, like, like a colleague from uh, Bolivia saying, then at least we know who did what, and then uh, responsibilities can, can be assigned. So I think that could be something uh, interesting related to decarbonizing. Then I think there was a question specifically to me related to national shipping line. Uh, should governments uh, you know, go and have national shipping lines? My experience has been this, 
I used to be on the board of a director of a state-owned enterprise in Thailand that used to be a national shipping line. And what I did with it, I closed it. So uh, I don't really agree with that. But what I agree is that it is important for countries to have their own national shipping fleet. But the fact of having one national shipping line, uh, it's, it's, it's freedom of the sea. It's... Uh, it's market condition, so it's very difficult for government. It's not the role of the government to do business. It's the role of the government to facilitate. And I think th this is where all this interaction with uh, private sector and academia then becomes very important. So I think with this, I'll, I'll, I'll end my, my, my comment. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I think this is a fitting place to uh, uh, end our discussion. As you said, get the private sector to do the business, but get the government to create the uh, enabling environment for the private sector to flourish. I think this is a good place to end. I'm not going to conclude because there were a lot of ideas that came through. I think we need to hear all of what you said and really internalize. And please also take the opportunity of all the participants, the member states, to reflect this discussion in the ANTAR 15 text. I think it was very clearly uh, something that came through the trade and transport facilitation is, is critical and uh, digital solutions and automation is the way to go in bringing this efficiency gains. And I think there were a lot of discussion we had about the climate change issues. You know, it is, in, it, it is the big elephant and it is now amidst us. And we really need to pay attention at all levels for the climate change and the mitigation and adaptation. Yes, we all know this is all very good for us. We want to go for it but we also need to understand the cost for small uh, economies and how do we bring the international collaboration uh, in, in this area. And uh, so let me uh, get everybody to give a big hand to our amazing panelists and I learned a lot. I took lots of notes and we will internalize as we go forward. And for the, your question about how, what can ANCTA do? As I mentioned to you, we are just an email away from you and all our work is demand driven and please you know write to us and say what you need and we will uh, work with you so having said that so let's give a big hand a virtual hand to our amazing panelists thank you so much and i think we are now coming to the end please uh, stay safe and be let's be connected bye 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 thank you bye bye thank, thank you, you so much have a nice day <laughs> thank you